It's a very warm welcome from us um, in Oxford. My name is David Mills, and it's a real pleasure to be um, fielding the home team today. Um, um, I, I'm going to be introducing our director for the Centre of Global Higher Education, Simon Marginson, who needs no introductions. So I, I won't spend too long on that, but um, I know that he's got a great paper for us today, reflecting on some of the work that um, his part of um, the CG has been doing. And the title, of course, is Higher Education and the Public Good, the Case of the UK. Before I hand over to him, just a quick bit of um, housekeeping. Um, we are going to be um, recording um, this, this Zoom webinar. And as with all of the many other ones we've done, and there are lots and lots of them now online, they are all um, put, put on um, the next day on, onto our website. When you're, um, there'll be a transcript as well. Keep your video off unless you'd like to um, ask a question at the end, in which case use the chat function anytime, write, write a question in the chat. And then um, at the end, I'll invite you to come forward and um, ask your question um, in, and turn your video on. Um, and I think that's all you need to know for now. Um, and I'm now going to um, thank you, Farhan, for showing that slide. That's brilliant. And um, with no further ado, um, Simon is going to be talking about higher education, the public good. This has been a really important theme for our work in the centre, the notion of the public good, exploring it in lots of different contexts around the world. Simon, the screen's all yours. Well, hello, everyone, wherever you are. And it's good to see people coming in to a, a webinar, which we only advertise quite late. Thank you very much, David, for coming in to the chair today. It's a great help. Um, and uh, it's an honour for me to present the first um, outcomes from our UK case study on higher education on the public good. Well, what does higher education achieve aside from the creation of benefits for individuals, such as expanded earnings and um, employability? How do we understand the public or common good, including the effects of education that are experienced collectively together, as well as severally? How does higher education contribute to the public or common good, or some would have it public good, goods as distinct from private goods? These are not easy questions to answer. And the answers vary by political culture and policy history. In the Anglophone world, in the neoliberal era, policy on higher education has been much influenced by Paul Samuelson's economic paper, The Pure Theory of Public Expenditure, published in 1954. For Samuelson, economic activity is normally realized as private goods and market transa transactions. If it's impossible to generate a profit, then goods or services take the form of public goods that are financed by government or philanthropy. The relation between private and public goods is zero sum. Your goods are either produced privately or they're produced publicly. The implication for higher education is that it ought to be produced in markets whenever that's possible. So taxpayer provision and costs should be minimized. Now this logic is never fully applied by neoliberal governments. They supplement the market with financing for individual opportunity, that is individual access to what is seen as a private good through grants or student loans. And most also see basic research as a Samuelson public good and support its public financing. But otherwise, neoliberal governments focus primarily on the private earnings and employability seen to be associated with higher education. These are emphasized to justify tuition fees and differentiate courses and institutions on the basis of the attributed value of graduate labor. An abiding weakness of this policy framework is that it underplays all contributions, effects, outcomes, and values in higher education that are not Samuelson private goods. This is a much larger domain than Samuelson's residual category of minimum necessary public good might suggest. These goods include the non-pecuniary effects of education for individual students, such as self-formation through engagement in knowledge and the augmentation of reflexive agency and sociability, which we've discussed in past CG webinars, and also the impacts of the sector in collective social relations like the population-wide fostering of literacy and technological capability, pure public health, 
compliance with law and enhanced political connectedness of graduates, tolerance of difference and more engaged international relations, economy building and society building in regions and cities where higher education plays a major role and so on. Now there's much research evidence on the contribution of higher education in all these areas. But despite episodic policy gestures towards ill-defined third stream or engagement, Anglophone higher education institutions struggle to gain recognition for their contributions to the public, common or collective social dimension. This almost certainly leads to under provision of public goods. Our present paper is part of an economic and social research council supported cross country study of approaches to the public good role of higher education. We've conducted research in Japan, China, South Korea, France, Finland, UK and Canada. And there've also been parallel studies alongside the main research project in Poland, Chile, Australia, and Russia. And this paper, as you can see, reports on the UK study. I first briefly review Anglophone political culture and notions of public, and then I outline the research underlying the paper and then move to the findings. Conclusions follow. Now, as in any country, approaches to the public good role of higher education in UK can only be understood in the context of Anglophone political culture and higher education policy, including the UK's own discursive history of public good in higher education. Now, Anglophone political culture has much in common with other Euro-American or Western political cultures. Euro-American governance is rooted in multiple authority and relational spaces partly outside the state. Anglophone society is divided between government as state with coercive powers, often potent within its limits, the economic market, civil society in a variable relation to the state, and the individual with an ill-defined normative primacy. The state is divided between executive, legislature, and judiciary. The boundaries between the state and other sectors are often tense and contested. The medieval university evolved with partial autonomy between church and state, creating space for universalizing scholarship and later for science. When modern government moved to build higher education systems and regulate institutional autonomy, the universities referenced the Humboldtian ideal in which the university served the state, but on the basis of freedom to teach, learn and research. Now, despite the four nations, UK remains highly centralized and top down, especially in England. UK is a constitutional monarchy governed by uh, a form of top-down sovereignty which was transferred from monarch to parliament after the 17th century civil war. It's not governed really by bottom-up sovereignty from below, as arguably some European polities are. Again, unlike many European democracies, but akin to the two-party US, the winner-take-all electoral system tends to favour single-party government. Now, and politics is dominated by prime minister and cabinet. Public administration, highly centralized in Westminster. Government is essentially controlled by the treasury, which leads social as well as economic policy. This is a highly centralized political system. In this kind of system, a coherent policy approach to the public good or the obviation of the public good can be readily shaped and administered consistently across all departments. The English speaking discourse of public and the pairing and contrasting of public and private exhibits multiple diverse and confusing meanings. The Shorter Oxford Dictionary, at the, in, its entry under the term public is 45 centimeters long, but three me meanings are arguably primary. I mean, first, the normative notion of a shared or universal beneficence across the whole social realm, as in the expression the public good. Second, public as a descriptive adjective, not excluding private, that signifies open and inclusive social relations, as in the expression public opinion. And third, the dualistic pairing of public with private as an analytical device. So they constitute zero sum parts of a whole. The public private dualism takes two forms that are somewhat sometimes rather crudely combined. 
In one, the political meaning, public refers to government or state as in the public sector. And this is distinct from the private home, family, economic market and corporation. For example, a national, state or public university is distinguished by its legal ownership from a private university. Now, the other meaning is the economic notion of a zero sum split between the private market domain, the dominant and favoured domain, as in Samuelson, and the public non-market domain, which is the state and perhaps also non-market civil society. The more that higher education is understood as private here, the less it is understood as public and vice versa. Now, our UK study included review of a small number of major policy reports and data from 24 semi-structured interviews. There were 13 interviews in universities, six in a London-based global research university and seven in a provincial research university, not in the Russell Group. And 11 other interviews, including four current or former policymakers or regulators, three leaders of national organizations, one a journalist in national media, and four academic experts on the topic. One person was in two of these categories. This is why they don't add up. The study incorporated a strong bias towards England within the UK. All 13 university personnel were within England and while the other 11 interviewees all had UK wide remits, all but one uh, of the 10, all, uh, all but one of them worked in England and the discussion almost entirely fell on England. Now we looked at landmark reports by Robbins 1963, Deering 1997 and Brown 2010. Now, most policy reports don't matter much in any jurisdiction, but in this highly centralized English se sector, some of them have taken on great importance. The question we were looking at was, what did the report say about higher education and public good or public goods? Now, to bring the discussion up to the present or closer to the present, at least, we added the Auger report of 2019, which is less of a watershed, but again, a window into the mind of government of the day. Now, through all the political regimes in the UK, from the welfare state of 1945 to 1975, to the high capitalism of the neoliberal era, the educational, social and economic weight of UK higher education has continued to grow unevenly, but the shaping discourses and rationales of policy have changed a lot. Nevertheless, one constant is that public good and public goods appear in none of these major policy reports. The term public is itself used quite sparingly, mostly to refer to government funding or the communicative inclusive public or the state as locus of the public interest. So we have to infer what's being said about public good from the reports rather than cite it, if you like, directly. The Robbins report normalized the socially inclusive principle that all qualified students who aspire to higher education should be able to enter which ignited a latent idealism across the country, even as some said at the time in treasury. The principle of growth driven from below became commonplace after Robbins, but it was new in 1963. Robbins rejected financing of the growing higher education system by fees and student loans. The objections to loans were, quote, it is a bad thing for young people to emerge with a load of debt, and the connection between higher education and earning power can be overstressed and loans will discourage participation. The fact that higher education created private benefits did not, in the view of Robbins, mean that it should be privately funded. The report noted that higher education, which was then 90% funded by government, was rightly of great public concern. And this called up the need for policy objectives and a system-wide approach. However, it stated, Institutions should enjoy the maximum of independence compatible with a modest level of necessary central control. Fast forward to 1997, more than a generation later. The Deering Committee met after three decades of tightening regulation and the advent of neoliberal business and market models. Nevertheless, it too conceived the sector in large terms. The purposes 
of higher education were to enable the development of individuals, to expand knowledge, to serve the needs of the economy, and to play a major role in shaping a democratic, civilized, inclusive society. Higher education should, quote, enable society to make progress through an understanding of itself and its world. This suggested a broadly conceived mission to further the, the public good, although it was not named as such. One likely reason was that the Deering Committee proposed the introduction of tuition fees financed by income contingent student loans in what had been a free system. To justify this, it stated students' obligations to pay in unambiguously neoliberal terms, not dissimilar to what was said in later reports, as you can see from the quote. So this is the beginning of the market system. Now, in 1998, the then Labor government introduced a £1,000 tuition fee without Deering's income contingent um, loan repayment mechanism. But in 2005, it applied the loan scheme that Deering had outlined, and we still have today, and it hiked fees to £3,000. Labor subsequently established an inquiry into fees and funding, which reported in 2010 after a Conservative Party-led government had been elected. Resulting Brown report proposed the largest transformation since Robbins. Like Deering, the Brown Committee began by couching the role of higher education in broad social terms and cultural terms, though it avoided using words like public or common. Higher education, it said, helps to create the knowledge, skills and values that underpin a civilised society. Yet after that grand statement, the broad, the broad role of the sector was never further defined, and the Brown Report immediately followed this passage with a discussion of the pecuniary benefits for individuals. And this was joined to economic calculations of the value of those benefits. Brown moved the English higher education from a mixed private public funded system to a universal quasi market with full price tuition fees supported by government supported income contingent loans so that most students would not have to pay in the year of study. The logic of the report was that any and every broad-based outcome of higher education would have to be financed by individualized tuition payments. With public resources now limited, it said, new investment will have to come from those who directly benefit from higher education. The shift from Robbins to Brown reversed the private-public relation in funding. Robbins expected government to carry the cost of producing private benefits to graduates along with the public benefits. Brown advocated the individualized private funding of what once were seen as public benefits. In the 2012 funding reform, a modified version of Brown's full fee quasi market was installed. Public subsidies for teaching were abolished, except in some STEM disciplines. Government also carried the costs of former students whose income failed to trigger a full loan repayment. But this was hidden by the ideological framing of the system as generating pro exclusively private pecuniary benefits. The Orga Committee usefully emphasized the combined tertiary approach across higher and further education. It was also asked to recommend on student tuition. And here again, the usual treasury politic prevailed. The report did not begin with a broad-based statement of the civilizational contributions of higher education as in Deering and Brown. It did note the considerable civic contribution of universities without talking much about it. However, it had no proposal to finance such public goods. It focused instead on enhancing value for money in a system that incentivizes choice and competition. So this was all about the individual consumer. Curiously though, in, this, in one boxed paragraph of a long report, the Orga Committee showed itself briefly aware of the narrowness of the Treasury Determined Policy Framework. And you can see that awareness briefly surfacing in the quote that's on screen. Now, this was all it said. This was as far as it went. The Orga Committee knew higher education generated public goods and its wider value should be recognized, but it just simply did not know how to do it. 
the report length visions of Robbins and Deering had shrunk to this one unresolved paragraph. Now, let me move to the evidence from the interviews. The data presented here derived primarily from answers to the following interview questions. What, what do you understand by the term public good? What do higher education and research contribute to the public good or public goods? And what are the main roles of government in higher education? What should government do? What should universities do? What should be the division of labor? Now, there was no single understanding of among the UK interviewees of the public good or public goods as distinct from private goods. But the answers were largely not neoliberal. More than half the interviewees developed an expansive, albeit ill-defined, domain of public action or public relations, sometimes linked to ideas of grassroots democracy. Now here, only a small minority of interviewees defined public using the Samuelson private public jewel in economics. When it came to public and private in higher education, a typical response was the middle level manager who stated that higher education was committed to serving society and making the world a better place. But what did this really mean? Well, understandings of the public good role of higher education seem to be strongly influenced by the existing government performance regimes, which highlight some factors and not others. These performance regimes included the REF, TEF and KEF, that is the research excellence framework, which referred to impact of research, the knowledge exchange framework and the teaching excellence framework. An executive leader in one national higher education organization noted that it was very difficult to create more comprehensive measures of the contributions to public good, although it was worthwhile trying to do this. However, interviewees emphasized that even the individualized outcomes of higher education were broader than the private pecuniary benefits like salary augmentation and employability. There was a public good component in the education of individuals as capable socialized and autonomous persons. This point was made repeatedly during the study. There was a shared concern that a focus on individual pecuniary benefits had narrowed ideas of the sector's mission. We need to think of education as being education, not training for a job, as one said. Another much discussed public benefit was higher education's role in facilitating social opportunity and mobility. This was actually seen as central to higher education's public role. Although several interviewees expressed doubts about its effectiveness in creating mobility, and there were also concerns that, it, that higher education was creating barriers that reinforced social stratification, barriers between those who received that, this private good and those who did not. Now, in the absence of perspective on the public event benefits for those outside higher education, for those people, higher education emerged as negative. When it came to direct discussion, of the Samuelson private public dualism in higher education, there was a curious variation. The economic they trained readily moved to, to this economic language while others didn't. But the approach also differed across the whole interviewee group between discussion of the outcomes of higher education and discussion of the financing of higher education. On outcomes, most argued that higher education generates a mix of individualized private benefits, pecuniary and non-pecuniary, and collective public benefits. The economists understood this collective aspect in inclusive terms, as did others. They moved well beyond Samuelson's limited idea of public goods. The zero-sum approach to outputs was largely rejected. Only one interviewee saw teaching as primarily generating private goods with research predominantly a public good, a viewpoint which is consistent with the UK economic policy as expressed through Treasury. But this was exceptional. Other interviewees saw teaching as having both private and public benefits. Nevertheless, the Treasury framework has more influence than this might suggest. 
when we move from outcomes to financing, we see this. While interviewees often saw the private benefits as con contained when within and consistent with the public benefits, the same people, same interviewees, generally advocated a zero-sum approach to financing. And this often seemed to be determining of everything else. The idea of the Robbins era, which is still the West European idea, I think, in most countries, that the individual contribution to financing is contained within collective public financing, the notion that the beneficiary earning higher incomes would necessarily carry part of the cost by paying higher taxation. That idea seems to have been discarded in the UK. In other words, interviewees wanted Robin's public and private outcomes without Robin's financing. Now, why did interviewees adopt this contrary position? Well, one reason is that the neoliberal corporatization of universities has left its mark. For example, one expert saw mixed private and public funding as foundational to autonomy. A university's contribution that was only public good would be in danger of being suffocated by the state. In the English system, institutional autonomy has long been fundamental. And then in the neoliberal era has become equated with financial independence. Several interviewees expressed themselves passionately about institutional autonomy. It was a recurring theme in the study. Here in the neoliberal neo era, student tuition plays a double role. As both the privatization of benefit, yes, justifying reduced government funding, perhaps, but also it's a source of university control resources. Institutions gained financial power from the 2012 reforms and the £9,000 fee at least until inflation began to eat into the level of that fee. In the domain of finances, though not that of mission or outcomes, it's possible to police a clear boundary between state and institution. So interviewees were less strongly concerned about the privatisation of funding than their stated commitment to public good might suggest. Further, while some were clearly unhappy about the student as consumer model, this, was not, this model was not inconsistent with financial autonomy and they didn't kick very hard against it. Interviewees were more concerned about the way the government was directly regulating autonomy through intervention by the Office for Students and the potency of the REF and the TEF, their capacity to shape the inner life of the sector. Even so, where and how the public-private funding line was drawn was chronically unclear during the study. What share would be right? 70% private, 50%, 30%, no one knew. Whatever their premises in other respects. Most interviewees saw the public-private split as essentially arbitrary. This uncertainty was shared by the economists in the group, partly because they too recognized the significant collective goods in higher education that were not acknowledged by the government's economic notion of a privately funded market. Interviewees were aware of an actual distinction between on one hand, the full cost tuition fees and the rhetoric about wholly individual pecuniary outcomes for teaching. On the, on the other hand, the ideal and the reality of mixed public and private outcomes. Yet the economic policy starting points that a private public split of funding ought to correlate with a private public split of benefit or mission or outcome. And this was the basis for a just financing system that also underpinned autonomy, continued to prevail in their minds. Now these premises are actually contradictory and were pulling in different directions. Hence the confusion, the lack of clarity, the wholly arbitrary nature of the private public funding split. Still, there was a shared recognition across the study among policymakers as well as the professors and university leaders that the balance had tipped too far to the private side. And one policymaker even remarked that in the framework of economic policy, in which institutions focus primarily on their self interest as corporations, a stronger orientation to the public good could be an important corrective. That is, the public good 
rather than the private tuition fees could be used to protect and advance institutional autonomy. So in sum, in higher education in, in England, there's an acute shared understanding of the private earnings and employment rates seen as consistent with graduation, but there's no consistent and coherent understanding of outcomes of higher education seen to be public. These interviews indicate broad awareness of and enthusiasm for both the non-pecuniary individual benefits and the collective benefits of higher education, in sharp contrast to UK Treasury-led government thinking. Many interviewees provided examples of such public goods. Most rejected the idea that public and private benefits are opposed to each other. Three of the four former and present policymakers in the study, as well as other interviewees, emphasized higher education's public good role and saw that role as wrongly neglected. However, there was no consensus, no clarity on the definitions, measures, or relative importance of public outcomes. And this undermined the potential for a forward move on public good. When it came to the binary question of who pays, no interviewee could decouple judgments about the funding system from judgments about the nature and purpose of higher education. Now, it should be possible to plan for a range of non-market outcomes, whatever the public and private mix of funding. However, the Deering, Brown, Auger and Treasury notion that the private character of the benefits determines the public and market character of the financing blocks a more expansive approach to public and collective goods. This is distinctly odd in one respect because policy has actually been driven by the reverse logic. The shift to private financing led to the idea of predominantly private benefits, not the other way around, as the policy reports show. But no one seems to think this through. The public role of UK higher education is stuck in the mud. A number of factors contribute to this. The power of treasury economics within the centralized Westminster system. The consistency between an ideology of privatized funding, corporate autonomy and institutional financial power. Though this is a devil's bargain, given that the, grow the growing central government influence in the content of education and research. But above all, the reason is that the UK has no shared policy language for talking about higher education outcomes other than individualized economic benefits. The larger policy language was emptied out successively in the passage from the Robbins report to the Orgo report and the corresponding ministerial discourse. Because the policy vision became hijacked by Treasury's need to advocate tuition fees. Private costs have been increased by successive governments against much resistance. The economic argument about largely private outcomes has been used to naturalize what is an entirely political decision to, to increase fee levels. Successive UK ministers have tightened this discursive link between the definition of benefit and the balance of funding. Governments determined to shift costs onto students and families have been unwilling to acknowledge the broad-based public benefits because that might bring taxpayer financing back into the equation. But while the private public structure of financing might appear to offer some kind of definition, it provides no stability. Just as the boundary between private and public good is incoherent, as is the boundary between the powers and responsibilities of government and institutions, so is the boundary between private and public costs. All three of these boundaries slip and slide and feed each other's instability. Without a clear cut position on the private public shares of tuition, either say free education or a pure private market with no subsidies or a firmly policed 50-50 split to underpin shared funding principle, the, fi the financing of tuition will remain politicized and volatile. In the regulated market system, tuition policy is vulnerable to continuous tweaks for short-term political and fiscal reasons as the post 2012 reform period has shown. By driving the whole of higher education policy with a funding formula, government imprisons public goods with any attenuated economic concepts 
of market spillovers and externalities. Yet many collective benefits of higher education are not economic, but social, cultural, and political. By breaking the nexus between funding policy and judgments about provision and activity, as the Robbins report was able to do, UK government and institutions could focus openly on the potentials of individual non-pecuniary outcomes and the many and diverse possibilities of collective goods. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the discussion. Simon, thank you very much. That um, it was really a great a great summary of of the work and and of, of so much of your thinking um, in this area. And I think um, it shows the value of actually listening carefully to people and what they're saying, um, and reflecting on that in relationship to the discourses that are available to them. So I'm really welcoming um, questions and comments and thoughts in the chat. Um, and if you want to, um, you, you can raise your hand, but it's fine also if you want to type your chat. Sam, before I, before I, I hand over to the audience, um, you, you, you made some really interesting thoughts there around um, the lack of a language to discuss public and private, or a lack of a, a willingness to defend the public role of higher education. To what extent do you think that sort of what you're picking up on is, is a lack of a language more generally for us to talk about why why universities matter i mean is there a sort of is there a british sort of um reticence to defend the role of universities is it because it's so tied to elitism i just i, I just you know I just, I just want to plant that one there as well because it's not simply about and the disfamiliarity with the the, the the public but it might be a broader a broader concern um but i'll, I'll let, let, let that rest with you and I, i'm going to go straight to the first mm -hmm. question um glenn did you want to come forward Glenn, um, are you, um, you've written in the chat. Do you want to come forward, Glenn, and ask a question? Oh, you, you said sorry. You, had to, you said you had to leave it. Okay, which, well, um, you've had to leave the seminar. So, you, Glenn, Simon, why don't you ask questions, Glenn's question, and then, but then I'll go on to um, Bala's question, and then Nick and, um, and so Bala, um, Glenn asks, what factors in the value of education that impacted detrimentally through marketization? Yeah, um, and I might respond to you too, David. I think the um, uh, the policy sphere was comfortable in talking about the broader benefits of higher education, perhaps not always fully convincingly, and not always in a way which was accountable. You know, which which led to visible scrutiny, if you like. But but was comfortable about doing so until um, until Deering, at least. And Deering reflects the Deering culture reflects that discussion as well quite broad-based discussion and quite um, many-sided and complex um, and engaging. But after that, you see this thinning out process where the, anything larger seems to be seen as a, a risk in terms of inciting an argument for public funding or perhaps diminishing the argument for shifting funding to the private side. And that has been persisted now for a generation and that's where the emptying out occurs. I think if you go outside the U U UK or certainly outside the Anglophone world, you can see plenty of ways in which national um, policy conversations entertain the idea of a larger role of higher education, both specifically and generally. Uh, and there's a comfort, comfort in talking about that in the Republican tradition in France, the larger public sphere is, is quite well understood and the role of government in facilitating uh, a, a sort of public approach to civil society and democratic approach in that sense yeah, and higher education's role and in that is, is again, it's commonplace. Although there's a, a pushback um, going on now from the, from the economists in France, and there's the same debate playing out there. It's just that it's much more, I suppose, evenly weighted um, than it is in the UK. And in the UK tradition too, you, you, know, you, you go back through the sort of annals of the Labor Party and social democracy, and, and you can see a larger conversation there. But I think that Peter Scott in his recent book is right. Uh, that um, we've never really fully um, embraced um, what mark, what uh, massification, what mass higher education means, what the public role is in that in that context. That could have triggered a larger, more public approach. It seems to have led to the reverse. Um, and yes, so the so the old public approach has been is now is now 
tag with the notion of elitism, as you said, and we haven't really found a new way of, of saying it, which is more, I guess, modern and democratic. Um, in relation to Glenn's point, I mean, I think, Glenn, the, the, it's not so much that things aren't happening. A lot of broader public activities are happening. It's just they're not as well recognised. They're not necessarily as well funded. And, uh, and institutions, leaders of institutions must do the right thing by their institutions as they see it. And that means following the incentives they're given. And the incentives they're given is that to fulfil performance indicators in the UK that are based around the idea of higher education as a private consumer benefit, with the significant exception of research impact, where there is an opportunity to talk about a larger agenda. And research definitely is the one area where you clearly see the public good role continues unambiguously with, with broad-based support, uh, although not yet broad-based support through re-entry into Horizon, <laughs> which we're all all praying for at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Simon. Let's go on to our next question. Um, hands came up first from Bala Subramaniam. Bala? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, my question is, um, is, is twofold. One is uh, the impact of the public-private um, debate on um, the institutions themselves. Um, I feel that, you know, having worked in the sector and still continuing, the impact has been in terms of how the universities interpreted uh, private public and the need for um, balancing the books so on. So this has led to a lesser uh, cross-funding between departments, between programs, et cetera, which means that each course uh, is supposed to be um, paying for itself. I remember I was, you know, in, in one meeting I was told that, you know, if you recruit less than 50 students, it's not worth having the course. So my question is, uh, is to what extent this debate has actually been internalized by the universities? The second, uh, adding on to this is in the, in the presentation, uh, I was wondering whether this debate has actually uh, extended to international students, especially in view of the globalization and also in view of uh, the universities depending quite heavily on overseas student fees. The one exception I found was the, 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 the director of SUAS was asking for uh, differentiated fees between different countries, poor and rich, so to speak. So I was wondering whether these two points are related or what uh, we could take from this. Mm. I mean, I, I think, Bala, I mean, that institutions must do what they must do. This is the, we can't expect individual um, university rectors, vice chancellors, presidents to take on the role of a, a, um, a well-intentioned minister. Um, their institutions have to survive financially uh, and they have to maintain their educational and research programs, their scholarship, their student care uh, through their financial judgments and decisions. So that constrains their capacity to move outside the settings that they're given. And if the settings are driving them towards, um, you know, a treatment of higher education as a private good, I think most people, and this was definitely borne out in our study, most people in leadership positions want to tick a lot of boxes. They want to do more than provide private goods. They want to provide uh, a better world for the, not only for their graduates, but for the societies in which they're situated and, and perhaps the world as a whole. Um, and the, the capacity to express a larger set of ambitions and objectives depends somewhat on the institution's own stability financially. Um, so I think that I think for that reason, I think we look to government uh, as the repository of the collective consciousness, the collective good. And so it's very disappointing when government drives everyone towards a narrow approach to outcomes when government should always have in mind the broadest possible approach to outcomes, I think. Um, the international students, very good point to introduce that into the discussion um, and a very sensitive and important point for the UK, isn't it? Because it's such a high level of financial dependence and the level of fees are very high for international students. Let's face it, they're very, very high indeed and they're high for domestic students, but gee, they're high for internationals. And um, uh, I mean, one of the components of our study is we're looking at what um, university academics leaders and also policymakers and experts are saying about global public goods. I haven't reported on that stuff today. We'll have a future webinar around that topic, um, looking at global public goods understandings in several countries. 
But, you know, during our study in the UK, we did ask those questions and some of our interviewees said, well, we see our contribution to international education as an expression of, you know, our commitment to the global public good. I do think that that's problematic because of the uh, highly stratified nature of the sample that uh, that can afford to pay fees. Um, and so um, if, if we are going to talk about global public goods, we need to be talking about that in the context of some kind of um, regime where there's significant scholarship support provided for incoming students, where students don't have to be rich to participate uh, in international education and so on. Um, and I mean, the, ideally what you'd like to see if there is a fee-based approach is a lot of fees being ploughed back into subsidies, scholarships, allowing a broader mix of students to come in and will come in on a purely commercial basis. We had one interviewee say to us during the study, well, if we want to contribute to global public good through international education, why don't we stop charging fees? Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it certainly, you know, makes the point, doesn't it? Great. Thank you, Bo. Great question. Yeah. Um, let's move on. And we have lots of questions, so I'll, I'll take us on to Nick. Nick Hillman, do you want to come ask a question? Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, brilliant presentation as always, uh, Simon. I wonder if I can make three really brief points and you can choose what, which one or not to respond to. But th this argument that, that um, the, the costs should be shared with the benefits. So in other words, let's say the public private benefits are 50 50 then the cost should be 50 50 i find utterly bizarre we we take it as read very often in higher education but no other public policy area considers it you know if i have a heart attack and i'm fixed up by the nhs no one no one says well some of the benefits are private and therefore it equates it you know the government's charge what they can get away with government with charging so that there's enough money to deliver all the public services they have to deliver um and, and I, I, on your point about the Treasury being phenomenally powerful, I, which I completely agree with, and one of the problems is, actually, there is lots of bits of government, in my opinion, that do understand the public benefits of higher education. I mean, when yeah. we put yeah. together the 2011 white paper, we had a nice big fat chapter about the public benefits of higher education, and number 10 struck it out because they said it was irrelevant and it wasn't as, you know, it, it, people wouldn't be very interested in it, but it was there um, and written um, still on somebody's computer somewhere. Um, and the third point I wanted to make, and it links to your very final point there about how you said somebody said, if we cared about the public good, we'd just get rid of fees. I couldn't disagree more with that. I mean, the high fees we have allowed the removal of student number caps and the number of places we have in the system is part of the public good of higher education. Um, and it's really, really important that that, I think, isn't lost in all these debates. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Very sharp, Nick, and and I, I think I'd like to avoid a debate about whether we have fees, whether we charge fees or not. I think that uh, we need to um, uh, understand this public-private benefits and the multiplicity of outcomes problem uh, by decoupling it, as your first point suggested, from the question of uh, the mix of public and private charges. I agree with you that um, mixed funding is... Is the, is, the, is the future immediately and perhaps longer uh, simply because we are not about to move into a high tax regime or indeed a high growth economy in the UK and we're not going to have the means to make um, uh, tertiary education free in the way the NHS is free at the point of delivery and subsequently. Um, so, I mean, the reality is that we have to try to think through these issues without driving them from the a, a formula on the on the funding side. We have to assume mixed funding for the foreseeable. Uh, we now need to try and separate that point from the point about what kind of outcomes we want. Uh, and that's really the main argument I'm making today. Um, I agree with you, uh, of course, that um, there's quite wide understanding in government about the public benefits and a lot of enthusiasm about talking it up. And this came through in our interviews. Uh, our interviewees did want to see the issue forwarded uh, had good points to make about it. Um, and uh, isn't it interesting that the, you know, the, 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 the chapter on public benefits was taken out because no one was interested. I think that's a sign, you know, of the way in which it dropped off the policy agenda. You know, it's, it, it could be made interesting. It could be made engaging. And, and, the, and, the, um, and the sort of separate discussion that goes on about the, um, about the social and community role of, of institutions 
the civic university discussion and so on, shows that there is an appetite for that kind of larger dimension, um, but it's not really brought in under mainstream policy. So the problem with the treasury approach, I think, is that it won't give authority to a larger set of issues. It simply confines the discussion relentlessly to a, a line of reasoning which will minimise public cost at all times. And that single, uh, singular obsession stymies everything else. But thanks for your points. And, and uh, obviously, I, I, I agree with, I largely agree with you. <laughs> Good. Um, yes, the, the baleful shadow of the Treasury, indeed. OK, so let's move on. Um, we have one question in the chat, but I think first, Thomas Owen, you had your hand up first, then I come to Rosarin. Thanks very much. Hopefully my mic's on and you can hear me. Um, thank you. That was a really interesting and, and valuable talk. Um, I had a question around some of the wider research which you touched on, and you'd mentioned that you'd done similar work um, in a number of countries, which I imagine yielded quite different perspectives. And you mentioned a couple of those in passing. So the Western European view, you know, some um, uh, some material from France. And I was wondering if um, if you could just say a little bit more about, I guess, countries which have a, a stridently different approach to the UK here, in which the public good is much more prominent in, in the discourse of those countries and maybe have been more immune to a neoliberal uh, discourse kind of coming to dominate higher education and it, it may be that that's in the you know wider research and other work that you've published around this which I'll certainly follow up but would be very grateful if you could say something about that now thank you I mean we, we will certainly bring be bringing that forward in future uh, there was a, a quite a good uh, session at the um, CG uh, annual conference on day two of the online conference where the Finland Poland and uh, and France cases were presented, and the way in which um, the sort of a broad public approach to higher education prevails in, in 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 especially in Finland, but also in France, it was made clear there. Um, that uh, that session uh, and the presentations by Eliza Bruce on Finland and uh, Lynn Courtois on France will be uh, posted on the CG website as soon as our uh, CG communications officer comes back from. Uh, sick leave she's unfortunately out of action at the moment um but so very very briefly because it is said in that in that um recording um in finland uh the the role of education at all levels is much the same in this regard that it is seen as a broadly public endeavor and benefit in the way we see the nhs as broadly public endeavor and um uh and an important part of that is the contribution that education makes to to providing fair opportunity and equality in society. Uh, and the the role of education in relation to equality is constantly stressed in at all levels of Finnish society. And certainly it's been part of the thinking of government. But interesting discussion, of course, is now going on because um, the um, Finnish government has, has looked at, the, at the, the take from international students in the Anglophone world as a number of other West European governments with free education have, have done and said, why don't we start charging these foreign students fees? Um, so instead of having a restricted number of them with free places, we can now start to have a larger number of them on a commercial basis and we'll um, perhaps teach some of them in English and, and that way we'll boost our higher education funding. So the treasury line, in other words, has got the better of the education department and uh, there's great consternation and concern in Finnish higher education, because there's a view that, and with some justification, that this could lead to further fee charging for domestic students long term, just as happened in the UK, Australia and elsewhere. So yeah, and very similar discussion going on in France, except further advanced on the fee, international student fee side, having been with the fees having come in a bit earlier, um, and that same debate occurring with rather stronger support for fee charging in France than in Finland. So um, yeah, so the, the, the neoliberal uh, approach spreads. Um, we haven't got, got to the stage where the West European approach has spread back into the Anglophone world yet, but I'm trying to do my best to try and get that going. I have no doubt single-handedly, Simon, that you'll reverse the spread of neoliberal discourse. <laughs> well done, you. My very good colleagues in this area. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to ask three more questioners to briefly give us their questions. And then, um, Simon, you can choose which ones you want to respond to within that last five minutes. So, Rosalind, you're in the chat first, then Richard, and then finally Ron.
Rosalind, do you want to come in and ask a question? In Hello. Hello, Hi. sorry. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is actually about the public universities in the UK in terms of their funding system, as they are public universities there, but their funding sources are mostly uh, from some private institutions and also about the tuition fees from the students. So how can we describe, how can we interpret this situation when we think about the definition of public university? and how also this situation affects the university autonomy and academic freedom, because maybe this situation, this private, depending on private institutions in, in terms of funding, does this make the universities and academicians uh, dependent on private universities, private institutions, sorry. Great question, Rosalind. Yes, the slipperiness of language, thank you. I'll move rapidly on to, to Richard and then to Ron. Here we go. Hi, Simon. Thanks very much for the talk. Uh, I My point of curiosity is the extent to which your research participants rationalised higher education goods as, as moderated by a discourse of relevance um, uh, and the, the magnification of, instant, of, of higher education relevance or else it's shrinkage. And if we took the former, for instance, and the extent to which higher education is rationalised in the terms of a policy imperative of continuous learning. So something around the intersection there, to what extent was higher education goods, how to, how were they rationalized, moderated, intersected by a discourse of relevance? Thank you, thank you, um, Richard, and, and Ron, finally. Um, Simon, hello, um, great talk as usual, masses there. I'm just wondering how you would answer your own implicit uh, uh, question. Uh, I'm wondering where we go from here. Uh, I'm wondering if you were speaking to the university vice chancellors collectively and others interested, the Nick Hillmans of this world, how can the sector try to move the dial a little bit um, so that the public goods are better recognised? Three minutes, Simon, it's all yours. Thanks, David, and thanks, thanks, uh, Rosalind, uh, Richard, and Ron. Um, I think it's a good question, Rosarin. I think this is very ambiguous now. Um, I mean, formally speaking, the higher education institutions are regarded as corporations and in some sense private now. Uh, and yet they're not, not as straightforwardly private as most private corporations, most of the big private corporations who, who affect our lives that we don't know much about. Um, universities are under, especially are under tremendously close scrutiny. They're seen as somehow public property or public matters in the broader sense of public uh, and, and, and they should be account accountable um, both to government and to the populace in relation to how they conduct themselves, what happens there and so on. So hence the academic freedom debates, the no platforming debates, all, all those show how, how much in the public eye they really are. They're not simply private companies operating separately. And that, so there are, there are high expectations still um, perhaps as high or higher as they were in the times when universities were com almost completely publicly funded. Um, so this is a paradox, isn't it? And uh, these are public institutions in a real sense, in a political sense, um, and in many respects in governance too, because the level of, of regulation and of intervention by government is high compared to many other many co private corporations would, who, who would bridle at the, at the extent to which they're in inner workings are uh, subject to scrutiny and are affected by a government action. Um, so, uh, and I don't think that's going to change. I think that there are going to be some, in that larger sense, seen as public, public property, public matters for some time to come. Um, autonomy? Yeah, well, I think the, I think that's been the device. I think you know whereby the Treasury's towed the vice chancellors with it. Um, it's offered them autonomy in a corporate financial sense. The uh, fee-based system has, to, has, has established a relationship, at least nominally and ideologically, between the payment of student fees and the financial freedoms of institutions to, to operate on their own behalf. And that's been a convincing um, recipe, a convincing argument, um, which has meant that, as I said in, during the presentation, while there are institutions are more passionately concerned about invasions of autonomy than they are about um, the fact that uh, that in some sense, uh, um, private funding uh, doesn't seem to have um, be consistent with 
the the, the public good remit. Um, Richard, I, I think I think our our um, uh, interviewees and you could I think interrogate who we who we talk to because that's obviously affected the the outcome of the study. Uh, I think our interviewees were not primarily focusing on relevance and if you like the connectivity um, between what institutions do and how they're seen. Um, uh, the discuss and this is perhaps another sign of the decay of this public good debate. You know that it was very abstract, almost nostalgic and historical in the way it was talked about. So as I said, there was no policy language. I mean, there was a policy language of a sort, and that's what people went back to because they remembered that in their career terms. So you had on one hand you had this hard edged discussion of relevance in relation to the KEF, TEF, and especially the REF. On the other hand, you had this very abstract, rather waffly uh, reference to public goods. Um, so I think much to unpack there. Um, Ron, the where, the, where, the where to from here? Um, well, you know, we look, I suppose we all kind of cling to the notion that the change of government's going to create a new environment, isn't it? And, uh, and that's true, I think. Uh, and you look to people in the likely front bench of that government who can carry these kinds of issues and can can, can move forward on with them. Um, you know, Charles Clark is still lurking there in the Labor Party ranks. Uh, you, you always feel that Ed Miliband is a person with capacity. You know, there are people who can take these issues up. If, if it's on the front burner, though, is another question. Uh, I suspect that um, sorting out the higher education sector is not going to be a frontline problem, um, but we all know that it needs to be done. Um, we've had the, the Willett settlement. It's It had many benefits in the first three or four years for the institutions, produced a tremendous surge of, um, of, of resources for them and lifted their global pos and European position quite considerably. Uh, and then, of course, has run into sand and, of course, has also, to some extent, not been on it in its original form either, which hasn't helped it. Um, now we need a new system. We need a new settlement. But when's it going to happen if there's a change of government um, next year? Uh, we're probably looking at two or three years after that before we'll see something new in place. I hope that the, a new government sets up a committee of review, you know, and I hope that not that it's got a brief which is not too narrow and not too wide um, and one which takes in a range of voices and not just our own, um, but, um, but also is capable of a coherent response. In other words, a very well-led public review. That's what we... But you know, will will Treasury, will government, will the, the tabloids take any notice of, of a review? I think yes, some reviews matter. And you know, Robin's a good report, mattered. Deering, not as good a report, but mattered. Uh, Brown, a powerful report, very cleverly done, that mattered. So we could have another report that matters. It could be a, a point at which change occurs. Um, but I think it's a case of watch this space and all of us have our own role to play in this discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Ron. Um, Simon, you left us with this vision of the margins in report mattering, but even no. if it's not you on that review. Uh, uh, the I, 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 Barnett report will do. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope if nothing else, our seminar series and our centre has, has pushed the importance of these conversations and of, of re-establishing the need to have a language in which to talk about the common goods, as you put it also in other places of higher education, the public goods. So thank you all very much for coming today. Um, great conversation as ever, great presentation. We are back. Um, very shortly on, on Tuesday next week, talking about higher education in the Philippines, nationalism and cooptation. We hope you'll all join us then. And as ever, um, make the most of our, of our webinars and our um, working papers online. Thank you all for coming. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.